one of our friends that helps to lead the Plant City one had invited all of us out for a barbecue that she was going to pay for because she had just gotten a new food stamp card. And this week somebody stole her card. And so Richard and Heath and I decided we're going to have a cookout because we'd already planned it and we're going to make sure that she gets good barbecued food. Her heart was to reach out and to love others. When I watch that level of pain, let's allow our hearts to be always open in compassion to those that are scattered, the orphan spirit, those that are fatherless and motherless. There is an answer. And again, I love meeting physical needs, but silver and gold, we don't have a whole lot of that, but, but Jesus, we have the one thing that every single breathing human being needs more than anything else, and that is the hope and the personal connection and relationship with Jesus. And we are empowered and emboldened to offer that hope. And so in every part we walk into, in every office building we walk into, in every school we walk into, we walk in with the most significant gift to give. And we don't do it on our own. We do it empowered by Holy Spirit. And so one of the great joys of this spiritual family is to partner with Peter Vaughn Sr. and Joan. And they are missionaries and in a period right now of kind of transition, looking at some new opportunities. But I just wanted them to come and greet you. They're part of us. And uh, we especially love your son and have a deep affection for him. But we love you as well. Come and share just a little bit about what's going on in ministry and then um, I would like for you to introduce your son tonight. Will you do that? He's, I will tell you, he's one of the best teachers I know, so I don't know if even you and I can hold a light to the teaching he does. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. What a privilege. Um, oh, my goodness, don't even know where to start. Tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go through. Thank you. She's, she's already teaching me things here. We're going to go through, uh, can we dim the lights inside there so we can see a little bit better? Um, ah, all right, these, we got uh, our ministry goals here. When we first went there was to support children's rescue homes. Um, hard to tell you just how desperate it is without just breaking down. Um, they will sell a baby for $15 up in the mountains. Or if you don't have $15, give them a pack of cigarettes and they'll take that. And what these people from the cities do, they buy these children and then raise them in the city into prostitution and into sex trafficking. It's the second worst country in the world for sex trafficking. It is is so sad. So our mission reason, we call ourselves mission support more than missionaries because the missionaries are the local people who go into these areas, rescue these children. We can't go there. There's a lot of areas we're just not allowed to go. We've been to a few and very dangerous. But they rescue these children and raise them in a Christian home, uh, educate them, feed them. And that's, that's where our, our ministry begins. Um, next, and then here's just some pictures here of uh, some of the children that, that we rescue, you see them there on the right-hand side with fish. We, we go to these places, and we set up fish tanks, and um, these you'll see the, the middle picture is the fish. When they get there, their fingerlings about three inches long, and when they get to about a pound and a half, they start eating them, and they eat them, believe me. Uh, next, um, there's our children there. If you notice the stuff on their faces... It's from the bark of a tree, and it's for three reasons, beauty, uh, skin care, and also sunscreen. So that's just part of their, their deal. Next, the next ministry is providing disaster relief. And um, when we were in Ecuador and they had the earthquake, we were able to rescue thousands of people by bringing fresh water filters and Part of your money that comes to us goes in helping this. 
we, uh, if we showed you some of uh, the pictures, let's just move on a little bit here. Next, um, there's the, uh, we'll buy rice on the right hand side there. We'll buy 13, 14 tons of rice at a time. And then we have a bunch of young people who break it down into what? Uh, 11 pounds, uh, take a bottle of oil and then uh, some either fish or lentils or, or eggs um, just to feed them. As you, On the left, top left hand side, these people are on the run. This is in Myanmar right now and uh, the, the, their own military are destroying uh, their villages, bombing them, uh, 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 just absolutely despicable. That, And the first thing they do is destroy every church, every Christian school, every Christian hospital. They go in and just wipe it out, totally destroy it. Next. Uh, there we are. And, and you'll notice on the right-hand side, uh, we're dealing with Muslims. And that in itself is a miracle because uh, the people there hate the Muslims. And we said, no, you Christians, you can't do that. You've got to go and help them. So we met uh, the restaurant owner, and I'd gone to him and said, look, what do you do with the food left over at the end of the night? We'd like to buy it. And he said, Why? I said, well, there's people we feed uh, that are hungry and don't have food. And he said, oh. He said, that's what I do. He said, I take the food that's left over to the Muslim community. And I said, oh. And he said, but you don't, you people don't help us Muslims. I said, yes, we do. I said, we're all God's people and God loves you. And he said, you'd come and feed out people? I said, yes, we would. So on, we went out, bought tons of rice again, put it up to package. Now, we did some strange things we didn't know. The first package we got to, first to the house, uh, the government had told us social distancing, and they put a tape up that you can't cross. So we put the food on the floor, and they would come. And next minute, this man grabs me, and he says, oh, now, now they can't eat the food. I said, yes, they can. He said, no. He said, it's, it's desecrated, it's unclean. And I said, okay, we'll take it to the next house. He said, no, you can't give it to anybody. I said, well, can we give it to the pigs? No. And I mean, they were serious about it. So we had to take that food and destroy it. Fortunately, it was just one package. But it was interesting. So we're going door to door, house to house. And the Muslims would say, why are you doing this? Why? Why are you doing this? And we were able to say, you know, one day somebody came and told us about Jesus and he changed our life. And they would say to us, come in, come tell us about your Jesus. So we just had breakthrough after. I wish we had time to share stuff, but let's move on. Next. Um, what's that? I, this was another group that was in Tachile in another area because so many of these groups had, um, that had children's homes were opening their places to, to the local villages. So when it came COVID and everything was shut down, suddenly all these villages were starving. So these groups would put together, you can see again here, the oil and the eggs, and here they are on the right-hand side handing it out. These were two Christians because in this case, it was, this is how God provides in COVID that there will be resources for Christians. ministry goals were to train the local pastors on discipling disciples. You know, your pastor mentioned something just a few minutes ago, and let's go to the next picture quickly. Here's Joan training one of the Christian disciples. Yeah, the, the whole idea is that it should be indigenous pastors who are telling their own people about the Lord. So our job was to get 
these, these um, believers together and be able to work with them during the week so that they would go to the village on the weekend and um, present the lesson. And those people that had heard the lesson would go to the next village and present that lesson, and that would go farther on. Oh, yes. All right. On the right-hand side, this was a lion for God. This, I went with her into hospitals where she would put her hands on monks, which there you don't touch monks, particularly as a woman. And she would say, but they are suffering. The hospitals were kind of just clinics. And she would say, come with me, sister. And I'm going, oh. And she would say, all right, come on now, come on. And she would say, are you hurting? Oh, in her... Oh, yeah. Let me pray for you. Lay hands on monks and they would be healed. It was unbelievable. This, this is actually in various different the, the, um, homes. and You'll see that they're celebrating the Lord's Supper with rice and with um, water. And here they baptize. The, all, the children, all the people that they had brought to the Lord are young believers. We taught them, you have brought them to the Lord. You will baptize them. And by the way, that, that, that water is so filthy, and it's got these le leeches in them and, 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 and snakes and all kinds of things in there, and I'm glad they were baptizing, not me. The next one will show you, now is where we are um, training pastors. I'm just going to tell you one quick story, okay? You never know whose life you're going to touch when you tell your story and the Jesus story. And I wish I had time to teach you it. It is so simple. Your story is, there was a time in my life when I was angry, full of hatred, and then someone told me about Jesus. I believed and he changed my life. And I became full of joy and peace. That's your story. Okay? You put in your words. Okay? And then we tell them the Jesus story. So, here we are. And, and we, we're training people. And, so, and Joan does most of the training. And so she says, now who'd like to share their story? And this middle-aged lady stands up. And my interpreter says, Pastor Peter, she knew. She knew. And I said, that's okay. No, no, she knew. She knew. And I said, it's okay. I'm thinking he means she's new. This is her first time. Because I think I'm training them to disciple. I think I have believers who have said, yes, I want to go out and I want to learn how to do this. So this is my idea. I'm training believers. But she says, yes, I'm ready. So then he says, Pastor Peter, she knew she's not Christian. So I'm going, what do we do? So Joan, not my fault, Joan says, <laughs> come up, come. And she comes up. And she says, I was an orphan from birth. They gave me away. Nobody wanted me. And she said, you know, yeah. Many people don't like orphans, don't take care of us, won't give us work, won't help us. And she said, tonight, that man sitting there, that old man sitting there with gray hair, and I'm looking for him as well, and she's pointing at me. Tell me that God wants to be my father. And tonight, I make him my father. And, and we just sat there, we're going... So then there's another gentleman who comes for the first time. But he, he, he doesn't make a decision for the Lord, but he comes back the next week with three of his friends. So we talked to him and said, you know, um, I'm so glad you bring your friends, but you don't open your heart to Jesus. He said, yeah, these three people, they are really bad. He said, they are bad, bad men, and they need Jesus. So I say, if Jesus can change them, then I will come. 
And he said, tonight, I want Jesus in my heart. We learned so many times that the Holy Spirit is working, and sometimes he's just waiting for us to get out of the way. <laughs> but you've got to go to them. What else we got? More? I think that's it. Yeah. Bye. Um, you've got to share your story. What your pastor said tonight, I'm telling you, just share your story. We live in a broken world. We live in a broken, they are broken people. They, they don't know where to go, where to, where to turn to. If you don't know how to do it, call me while we're here. I'm sorry? You're going to teach him now? He's going to teach you now. I want to introduce you one of the greatest men I've ever met in my life. I was remembering when he was born. Oh, my Lord, what a joy. What a joy. And what a joy it is to me now. Um, you don't know much about him. I know things about him that you should know. But he loves the Lord, and he loves me, and that's all I worry about. So, God bless you. Well, I've got my bag ready. Are you ready tonight? Yes. Are you ready? Ready. We're ready. Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can sit around your word. And uh, Holy Spirit, as you open up our hearts and our understanding and our minds to hear your Holy Spirit speak to us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, the older... Um, the older I get, you, you know how some people get embarrassed about their parents, you know? It, it's, it's a real problem, and I'm serious right now. Believe me. Some people are embarrassed to talk about their parents and embarrassed about them. I couldn't be more proud of my mom and dad. I mean, I, I know a lot of people that when they reach their age, they want to buy a little boat and sit on a dock somewhere and catch fish. And I'm yeah. like, that's fine. And for people to lay their down, down their lives to go and preach the gospel. Man, they're my heroes. I love you too. Don't get me going now. You see, you tripped, you started something now. We will fight as well. We will. We'll this is um, one of my second last talks that I'm going to be giving here. <clears throat> and I shared with God, go, don't get depressed, please. My goodness. And I said to God, there's one thing that I want to speak about, and that is how to share the good news. I had, what I'm teaching tonight is not something I just teach. You heard bits and pieces about it tonight. It's what we live. It's what we do. And so I want to pass on some things to you tonight that I honestly believe lie at the heart of what God wants to do for us, okay? So we're going to talk tonight about, in our series about it, the how-to series on how to share the good news. And I can promise you that tonight, I can tell you tonight that the outcome is going to be different than what you expected. I can tell you that now. So tonight... We're going to look at Jesus, and I reckon that the best place to start is to see what Jesus did, not to go into some theories. Let's have a look at what he did, because everything about Jesus was coming down to earth to model a new way of living and a new way of reaching people. Do you agree with that? It wasn't just a religious thing. It wasn't just Jesus coming down to save people. No, he came to model a way of living. In other words, he came as a, as a man, as a, as a human being filled with the Holy Spirit and demonstrated how we should live life and how we should spread the good news of the kingdom. We have to understand that. So I want to read some passages tonight, and I want to show you tonight two examples of how Jesus made disciples, two main examples, and we're going to work more on the second one, but I want to read just so you can read with me in the first one. And that is how, did Jesus, how, how Jesus connected to a lost person. So if you, fo- if you want to follow, look at Luke chapter 4, verse 38 in the New Living Translation. And 
I'm just going to capture just a, a passage here, and then um, we'll go into Luke chapter 5, and then I want to highlight some things here. So uh, Luke chapter 4, from verse 38 in the New Living Translation, after leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's house, we're talking about Peter now, and where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever, and everyone begged, please heal her. And standing at her bedside, he spoke to the fever, rebuking it, and immediately her temperature returned to normal, and she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. Hey, listen, if you want food, heal mama, okay? Just make sure mama's okay. There we go. And number four, verse 40, it says, as the sun went down that evening, listen what happened. People throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Everyone say healed. So this is what Jesus modeled. Amen? Yes. Let's go into Luke chapter 5, and let's read from verse 1 there. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. And Jesus noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and they were washing their nets. You can see that scene there, right? Okay? And stepping into one of the boat, boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it into the water. And so he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he, had, he, had, he said to Simon, now let's go out deeper. Everyone say deeper. deeper. Come on, work with me. Deeper, right? Deeper. And, let's, and let down your nets and you will catch many fish. And Simon is this smart uh, Alec, let, let's call it. There we go. And he says, Master, he says, we worked hard all night and didn't catch a thing. Now, that doesn't even make sense for a fisherman. But if you say so, we'll try again. And here's Peter's breakthrough now. It says that at, at this time, the nets were, it says, they lowered down the nets, and he says, at this time, the nets were so full that they began to tear, and so they shouted out for help with their partners on the other boat, and soon the boat, both boats were filled with water on the verge of sinking, and Simon Peter realized what had happened, and he fell to his knees before Jesus, and he said these words, oh, Lord, please, just leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the size of the catch, as were the others with him. And his partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were all amazed. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Wow. Now listen, I, if, I was to, if I was to ask you, what, is, what kind of model do you use to win people? And if we were to look at the model that Jesus did here, what did he do? And so I want to take you through, through, through eight, eight steps very quickly. Just, I just want you to look at what happened. What was the process? What was the sequence of events that brought Peter from being a total stranger to the place that he left everything? Because many people have the idea that Jesus just came to, to Peter like Steve here. Come in. All right, Steve, you come follow me. And then Peter just left everything and followed Jesus, right? That's the idea we get from reading that. But that's not what happened here. And Luke is the only one that lays out a sequence of what happened that this man would lay down everything and follow Jesus. So I'm going to go through them very quickly. Number one, number one, Peter witnessed Jesus' baptism. So he now is just on the edge of the water, and in Acts chapter 1, verse 22, because it was one of the requirements to be an apostle, is that they had to have witnessed the baptism of Jesus. So Peter was standing as a stranger by the river Jordan, unseen, unheard, didn't, Jesus made absolutely no contact with this man whatsoever. Number two, he heard Jesus preach in the synagogue in Capernaum. If you ever go to Israel, I've been to Capernaum, it's amazing. There's nothing there anymore. I'm going to go on. Number three. Number three, he invites Jesus to come to his home. And Jesus heals mom, mother-in-law. All right? This is the sequence of events now. 
So, so now, all of a sudden, he hears Jesus is fascinated. Come to my house, and mother-in-law is sick. Let's just, Jesus, please, can you just, just heal mother-in-law here? Good thing, like I said, she made food, right? The next thing happened is that that night, we just read the scripture, that night they saw many miracles. People brought people in there into Peter's house, and Jesus is healing the sick. And it says everybody that Jesus prayed for got healed, everybody. So he saw miracles. Number five, Jesus, Jesus now does something differently, differently. Instead of now Peter inviting Jesus to come into his house, Jesus comes into his business. Goes to his place of employment. Huh. Hint, hint, hint. Clue, clue, clue. Jesus borrows his boat, and then we have this encounter where he obeys Jesus to go deeper, and he does what Jesus tells him to do. Now, listen, Peter, who's the professional fisherman here? And Jesus comes as somebody who performs miracles. And so Jesus comes and he says to the professional, do this. That makes sense, does it? And he obeys, and he sees this miracle. It says, then, Peter was so overwhelmed. Jesus, get away from me. Do you want to know why some people don't want to come to a religious building? Because they, they don't want to be here. It's not, this is not the place. That's why we've got to go to them. Yeah. And it's at that point Jesus turns to him and says, Follow me, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. That's model number one. I want you now to go and have a look, and I'm not going to read the whole story. The next one we find in Luke chapter 10. I love Luke. I love this guy. And in Luke chapter 10, it starts with Jesus calling his, the 72 together because in chapter 9, he had already sent the 12 out. In chapter 10, he gathers the 72 and he calls them and he gives them power and authority. And he says, I want you now to go to all the villages and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lay out something. So he says here, he gives them the next, just I want to sh what Jesus told them. Let's go on. He told them where to go. He told them what they would encounter. He told them what to take with them. He told them what to do. And then he told them what to say. Clear, simple, right? There it is. They go back and they see amazing things. And in that passage there, Jesus talks about what the places they were to do. And I'm going to break it down into five, five things tonight. About, and I want to give you a Luke 10 breakdown of what happened. Let's go to the next one. What's, what is the breakdown of the, of the things that happened here? The first thing, and this is what happens. Number one, is to go and enter their place. And I'm calling that the salt principle. Be there. Be in the midst of people. It's not an invitation to come. It's an invitation it's a, invita it's a command to go for the disciples. It's not the disciples to go out and invite people to come to the synagogue. No, it was Jesus commanding them to get out of the synagogue and go into homes and go into the business. Yeah. Another clue, clue, clue here. The second, break, the second lesson that we see the highlight principle is what we're, what we're going to talk about tonight is the favor principle. The person of peace, the favor principle. We're going to break these down in a moment. The third one is, is probably one of my favorite, is eat and drink. Have a party. Mr. Bob. <laughs> number four, number four is demonstrate the power of God. And number five is then to share the good news. This was not a suggested model. This is what Jesus said. This is the sequence. This is what I want you to do. And if you'll notice that in Luke's rendition of this thing, is that sharing of the gospel came right at the end, not in the beginning. They didn't start by preaching. They started by being 
in the midst of these people. Listen here. I grew up in church. When I was three days old, I was in my first church service. I was born on a Friday. Sunday, I was in church. I have grown up in religion, in church and structures. I have studied every imaginable model of ministry that it is. And one thing that I have come to the place, the conclusion I've come to, is that we need to get back to what the Bible says we need to be doing. And not be shaped by models of ministry, by come up by really clever and sincere people to say, how are we going to reach the lost? Let's have a look at what Jesus said to do and do it. It does not, some of you clapping, that's okay. Some people don't. Listen to me. Let me tell you something. You talk to mom and dad and they will tell you that all of the teaching models of making disciples, that 90% even more omit the demonstration of the power of God out of what they do. Take it right out. And it's now not just about preaching the gospel, it's just about sharing, you know, being encouraging people and loving on people. Let me tell you something. We have to listen to what Jesus said, and we have to do what Jesus did. And I'm, I'm just, listen to me, I'm 57 now, and I've, I've been, like, guy, we, we, we share... I've done over 30 years, 33, 34 years of ministry. And today I'm more determined to go back to what Jesus said we need to be doing. Because if you look at the New Testament, everything that the disciples did and the apostles went out forward, they worked in the same principle that Jesus told, he demonstrated and what he taught his disciples to do. So why on earth are we trying to meddle with formulas and with models that have got no power, they're not reaching the lost, and people's lives... Listen, Paul actually said, he said, some people are hearing good news, but they're hearing words of man's wisdom. We'll look at that in a moment. Um, I'm, I'm animated about this. I'm animated about this. I'll tell you why. Because the majority of people in churches are not doing this thing. And there's a, there's a group of people that just said, wait a minute, why am I not seeing the results in my life? I, let's, let's talk, forget about other people right now. Let's talk about me. Talk about you. What kind of fruit are you seeing? Are you seeing the sick healed? Are you seeing people radically transformed by the power of God? So let's break down this strategy on how to. Let's go to the next one, please. How to. This is a how to thing. If Jesus modeled it and he taught and instructed the 72 to do it, then I say to you tonight, you can do this also. Including the supernatural. Peter, you don't understand. I'm shy. And I, um, I'm introvert. I, I'm, I'm, I am that too. Well, I don't have a degree in theology, and I haven't been to Bible school, and I'm like, none of the disciples did either. And yet Jesus changed the world. He changed the world with people that would listen to him and do what he said. So let's break down the strategy. Let's, let's break it down piece by piece, okay? And I, and I, I'm, 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 I, trust, I trust you. You're not going to catch something here. I'm praying that you'll have something hit you here and say, whew, I need to catch this. I need to catch this thing. I need to hit. This thing needs to get me in my spirit. So let's look at number one. Go, go and enter in places. Enter in places. I, I tell people this. Listen to me. When you catch fish, and some of my best fishermen friends are not here tonight, um, you don't put at the end of the line the food that you like. You really put at the end of the line what the fish likes. So if you like steak, it, uh, you don't put steak at the end of a, you put something else that's going to, you understand. The first part is for us to immerse ourselves 
and intentionally develop relationships with people that do not know Jesus. The message is not to invite them to come to us. The, message, the command is for us to go to them. And so I want to say the simple thing tonight. And I, I'm going to give you some scriptures that you can just highlight over here. First, First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. By the way, I'm going to have my notes available on the website. I'll put it up there. So you'll be able to download these notes. If you don't catch the scripture references, you'll be able to get them there. The first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 to 11. And there was this whole discussion about hanging out with unbelievers. Because the church in Corinth had this misconception that the church was not to hang out with unbelievers. And Jesus, I mean, can you imagine that? And Paul says, are you guys crazy? In that, if that was the case, then you'd have to be taken out of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. And I, I want to ask you, listen, and I put their New Living Translation because in the New Living Translation, in those verses 19 to 23, five times he repeats the phrase, so that I can bring them to Christ. I would like you to say that with me. So that I can bring them to Christ. So that I can bring them to Christ. Five times in that passage. And what did he do? He says, to the Jews I became like them, so that I can bring them to Christ. For those who do not know the law, I became like them, so that I can bring them to Christ. Now, one of the themes there, one of the key words in that, in verse 22, is the word common ground. And he makes the statement, he says, try to find common ground with everyone. So that's what it means to go into their world and into their spaces. Find common ground. What does that look like? What does that look like? I want to show you quickly. Put up the next one, please, Sarah. She's good. I like that. Sarah, thank you. You know, part of ministry and evangelism is that we don't focus on this first point because it's all about us preaching to the lost. Can I share with you that the heart of evangelism is to open up your, your, ear, open up your ears and shut your mouth and just listen and see what people, where they are. I've seen some people so rabid and so desperate to share the gospel that they don't listen to the story of the person sitting in front of them. And I want to tell you something, the clues for that person's salvation is what they share with you. So quiet your mouth. I, I, all right. Can I say, it's okay, it's okay to say in church, just shut up. Just sometimes you need to shut up. Some of, some of, some of us guys talk too much. Just listen, shut up now, just quiet. Oh, there we go. Oh, yes. Number two, listen, start looking for common needs that we all share. Look for common needs. This is common ground. Number three, identify struggles and pain and trauma and failure, weaknesses. Man, listen to me. Every single one of us qualify right there. One of the biggest things I can share with people is say, man, I'm, I, I nearly died. I said, man, I did die. I was on an operating table and I've got scars to prove it. I said, man, my marriage is a mess. I said, I know what that's been like. I've been there. Right. Amen. I said, man, I've lost, I've been bankrupt. I said, guess what? I've had that too. People look at me and say, you Christian? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because life happens to every single one of us, man. Life happens. And I want to tell you something. I, I don't boast with those things, but I, I realized that God took me through all of those things, and he took me through them. Yeah. It's a story, man. Number four, no, where's number three? <laughs> oh, Sarah, I'm watching you. <laughs> number four, it's number four there. You know, when the soundboard starts talking back to the preacher, you know you've got trouble, right? <laughs> number four, share the precious of life. I, I talk about these things all the time. Everybody has health, finances, career, and relationships in common. Every one of us. I'm telling you, at certain given times, you will mess in all four of them at the same time. Find common ground. Find common ground with people. Find common ground. Find common ground. Just listen. Just get in there. Find common ground. That's why unity, that's why the parks are so amazing. 
I was sitting last Sunday just talking to Jean. I was sitting on a post there, just listening to Jean's story. Man, the stuff will mess with you, man, in a good way. When a guy cries over here over people and encounters that he had in the park and the brokenness of people, let me tell you something. We need to be exposed to the hurt and the pain that people are living in. Mom and dad would cry over the, over the needs of people in Myanmar and his children. That's what it means to go and enter. It mean, doesn't, this is what it means because when I grew up in church, it was all about coming to religious buildings on Sundays regularly and you never mingled with the world. And I want to tell you something, that's everything contrary to what Jesus said and did. Everything. Everything. Number, number two, I'm going I'm to highlight some of these points and just, we'll go, we'll go. The, the, the principle of peace, the favor principle. Have you noticed that God gives you favor with people that you can't explain? They like you for no reason that you makes logical sense. You like them and they like you. And I'm telling you tonight, whenever you see the favor principle at work, there's favor for a reason. Follow the favor. Follow the favor. Conversely, have you ever met somebody and they, you just can't stand them? They can't stand you? Don't follow that. So we now strive and we weeping over people that don't like us. I'm like, get over yourself, man. Go just spend time with people that God's given you favor with. So as Jesus said, go and find the person, the man of peace. Connect with people that God's given you favor with. Who can do that? Let me see your hands, please. Who can do that? I don't see everybody's hands. I'm asking, who can do that? Yep. You're well on your way. You're two out of five. You're good. You're doing good. You're doing good. This is good. Um, number three. Let's, let's just go on. You guys can catch this. You can read that passage in Luke 10. <clears throat> number, th- number three, eat and fellowship. Eat, eat and drink, have fellowship. Have fellowship. Now, this is more. This is more than just inserting yourself into their world. This is now when you literally sit at a table and you break bread together. Yeah. Now, it goes deeper now. There's something else. This is where Jesus comes into Peter's house. Man, there's something different. There's just something about a coffee sitting face to face with a person. There's just something about it. It's just something about having people come to your house. You're feeding them and taking care of them. There's, there's just something there. Did you know that food and drink is part of the, one of the most strategic tools of evangelism? Did you know that? So why don't we use it? How many of you love to cook? Let me see. How many of you like to cook? I'm just taking, just take notes, please, honey. Just. <laughs> I like to eat. We li- How many of you like to eat? That's a good question. Oh, you guys, are, you guys are terrible. You guys are just terrible. You guys are just too bad. Oh, man. Luke 5, 29. Matthew, Matthew. This, is, this guy's a sinner, man. He's a tax collector. Matthew throws a banquet to honor Jesus. Jesus doesn't walk around and say, I'm God. Nope, I can't come there. Jesus is hanging out with these people. I mean, even the religious crowd get irritated and say, how can you hang out with these people? Are you crazy? Luke 15, 2. I mean, this is it. Many dishonest tax collectors and notorious sinners often gather around to listen as Jesus taught people. Can you imagine that you are so grounded in the Lord that when you start speaking about Jesus, that sinners look at you and say, man, there's something about you. I just need to hang out with you. This happened to me. I've had people come, total strangers, and like, we need to just hang out. <laughs> you know what religion does? Religion makes you so arrogant and pride that people want to run away from you. I've seen that too. First Corinthians ten. You can go. You can re- you can read these passages. All right. Listen. Uh, Someone, 
Cesar Chavez says this, if you really want to make a friend, go to someone's house and eat with him. The people who give you their food will give you their hearts. They will do that. I've seen that. Number four. Number four. So Jesus said, now listen, go into these homes, find a man of peace, speak peace, eat their food. This is a whole breakdown. Do you understand? Are you, are you guys all with me so far? Yeah. You're with me. All right. Then here comes the switch that many religious people turn this one off because we don't want to offend the sinners with the demonstration of God's power. So we want to sanitize this thing. We want to prevent them from seeing demons come out of people. We want to prevent them from some... You understand what I'm saying? And I'm like, listen to me tonight. Listen to me. If you are offended by the power of God, you are in the wrong place. I'm sorry. I, I'm not talking about becoming cuckoo and crazy. And I, Please understand. There's a, there's a place of order. There's something with Jesus. There was something with him that, that he not only sat with people, but when they were broken, he actually prayed for them and healed them. Yes. I'm not talking about becoming a religious fanatic. And I can and tell you what, in American, in American TV and all kinds of ministries, there's so much show that goes on with the demonstration, quote unquote, of the power of God. And I want to tell you something. There's some of that stuff that every one of us need to run away from this stuff. But for goodness sake, don't throw out the, the demonstration of the power of God because some people are abusing it. Now, if you would notice something, that this is the first command in this whole sequence here that touches on the impossible. Every one of us at this point can go into homes. Yes and amen. Yeah. Every one of us can eat food. Yes and amen. How many of you can heal the sick? And yet, and yet, that was a command that Jesus gave them. He didn't say pray for them. He said heal them. At some point in my spiritual growth, I had to deal with this question and say, God, wait a minute. You have to understand I'm human and you God. And so we constantly relegate miracles to God. When God looks at us and he said, I want you to heal the sick. I hope that this, some, of, I hope some of this stuff offends religious people. Honestly, guy, seriously, I, I don't mean to be offensive. I'm not. That's not my motive here. My motive is let's get to the real thing. If Jesus healed the sick, and if He commanded His disciples to heal the sick, then why are you and I not pursuing to do the same thing? So I have to assume. That if Jesus commands, commanded his disciples to do something, he gave them the ability to do it. Yes or no? Amen. Yes. Would it, I mean, that just goes to say. You don't, I don't command somebody to do something in the military, command them to do something if they are incapable of doing that thing. That's just, they're just not how it works. So now let's re, re, reverse engineer the statement here. That if Jesus gave them the command to heal the sick, it means that he gave them the ability to heal the sick. And if for some reason it's not working for you, it doesn't mean that the problem is with God or his timing. It means that you and I need to figure out why is it that I can't heal the sick. And this is the outcome that I want to talk about tonight. Because sharing the good news, let me tell you, there are discipleship programs that will take you for six, I mean six months to a whole year just to learn how to disciple somebody. Let's get back to this place and say, God, teach me how to heal the sick. Maybe we should do that in one of these teachings. Of how, to, how do you heal the sick? Believe it or not, there's some strategies. There's some, let me tell you something. If you are connected to God and you're, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the power to heal the sick. So Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That's, 
That's Acts chapter 10, verse 38. This is Peter now. This is Peter. Peter. A few verses down, Acts 10, 44. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, it says this. And while Peter was busy preaching, the Holy Spirit fell yeah. on everyone in the house. Yeah. Whoo! <laughs> Patty and I had this, we had two encounters last week, one on Zoom, the other one was in, both on Zoom actually, where we had a meeting with, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just came, poof, whoa, changed the conversation. You see, here's the thing. We are trying to get, we're trying to get people encounter a supernatural thing, but we're trying to do it with human means. So we're trying to get them saved by n- n- normal means. You know, you, you say this and you do this and then people get to, Let me tell you something. It's all, this is all based on coming to the place at some point. You say, God, Holy Spirit, like my mom said tonight, it was beautiful. At some point, you get to the place and say, God, you've got to do something here that I, I, I can't do in my own strength. You're going to just have to, yeah. this is now. This is, your, this is God time right now. I, I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Are we good on time? Are you guys okay? I, I hate to bore you. I really, I don't want to do that tonight. No, no. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 2, two 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse 3. This, this is the heart of the issue here. This is, you guys believe the Bible? Let me say yes or no, you believe the Bible? You're going to do what the Bible says? All right, that's cool. All right, so let's see what Paul says. He says, I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. Can I tell you something? When you, when you walk in ministry as many years as we do, it's not uncommon for us to walk in fear and trembling. Ask guy. Ask my dad. Ask my mom. At times, are you really, God, is this you? Is this really you? So fear and trembling is like a feeling of your, your, your sense of your inadequacies without God. It's all very real. It's real. Paul says this. Now he says verse 4, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4. He says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And here he tells you why. So that... Your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. You see, when people get to see the power of God, like Peter did on the boat, he saw this as like God intervening in this situation here. He knew, he knew this was God. And so many times we're trying to argue people into the kingdom and we're trying to debate them and we're trying to give them words into the kingdom. Let me tell you something. What needs to happen at that point is they need to encounter the power of God because that's the trigger that switches them over because then the focus is off your words and it's on God. That's where it needs to be. Have a look at, have a look if you, if you, if you want to follow. I've, I've got to read one more, please. I, I, I teach this, this scripture every time I talk about this subject. It's Romans 15, verse 18 to 20. And I'm going to read New, New Living Translation again here. NLT, Romans 15, the reference is up there. Follow with me if you, if you can in your Bible. I want you to catch this with your eyes as well. So Paul writes in, he says, Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by by the way I worked among them. Can you see? Paul inserted himself in there. Now look at verse 19. They were convinced by my oratory skills. They were absolutely convinced by my persuasive personality, right? Is it all, is it there? How were they persuaded? How were they persuaded? How were they convinced? By the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's spirit. Why do we not live in this thing? So at some point, when you are sharing the good news, you have got to be constantly aware of where the Holy Spirit is directing. What's he moving? Where is he, what's he saying? What's, what, where does God want to reveal his power now? Okay. So I want to give you some practical things to do. The next one here. Number one, Jesus, said, uh, Jesus actually said, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You shall receive power when? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I want to tell you, every single one of you, every single one of us needs to encounter the empowering of the Holy Spirit like they did in the book of Acts. 
And I want to tell you something, mainline tradition and religion has moved away from this truth because they said it happened once and it's never again. Let me tell you something, if you live like that, you do not understand the Bible. Seriously. Because it didn't just happen in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. It was recorded in every, every single decade since the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's been outpourings of the Holy Spirit. It has not stopped. And I've studied, let me tell you, I've studied, out, I've studied these things. And so when you're in this situation, you ask the Holy Spirit for words of wisdom, words of knowledge, encouraging words, prophetic words. Man, I, I, I would come up to somebody and just share something with them. They're like, how did you know? I didn't know. It was, it's a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power. And then the third, the, the third most practical thing, I mean, if someone says to you, listen, I'm sick, my head is hurting. Listen, that's a, just a moment right there. You say, would you mind if I just pray for you right now? Right there. Jesus said, Jesus said, if you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Mark 16. So this thing is not about just, listen, we've got to get the, we've got to do the right things and we've got to immerse ourselves and we've got to eat and fellowship and all that. But there's a time that we've got to ask the Holy Spirit to change the equation right there. Who, who spoke about the woman at the well? It's exactly what happened. Now, there was no manifestation of healings there, but Jesus spoke a word to this woman that she looked at him and she said, Jesus, are you a prophet? How did you know these things? So she went back to her village and told them about what had happened, and they, they came out to Jesus. And one woman, one woman at a well, came, came back with a village, and the gospel spread into that village with one encounter, with one word of knowledge. Finally, finally, the last step, the last thing to do is to step over and share the good news. Now, I want to make a very, very important point here. At some point, you have to switch from a social conversation into a spiritual one. At some point, you have to switch from a social, how are you, are you okay, and what you need, to listen to this. At some point, you've got to switch the conversation to sharing the good news. Part of what my mom and dad do is to train what they do in, in, in Thailand, what they do in Goldsboro now, just to take people like this, like us, and prepare them, teach them. How do you actually share the good news? How do you do it? And I'm going to give you a breakdown. My dad, just, my, my dad mentioned two things. Number one, next one, tell them your story. Simple. Your story is what your life was before Jesus saved you, yeah. how did Jesus save you, and your life after salvation. Amen. Can you do that? Yeah. How, many of you, how many of you were really horrible before you got saved? Let me see your hands, please. All right, so you got a, you got a story. April, you got a story. How, how many of you, you, you can tell a story what you were like, and then how did you hear the gospel that you got saved, right? And how has your life changed since then? That's your story. Like, simple. It's so simple. You see, when we hear the word preach, preach the gospel, preach the gospel, you know what our religion has taught us in this culture? Is that preaching of the gospel is relegated to the professionals, the preachers. And that, that was one of the things that undermined the preaching of the gospel right there. Because everybody felt totally inadequate. I'm not a preacher, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a preacher. Well, I, I'll let Pastor Guy preach. He's the preacher. Common ground stories, common ground stories are so powerful. Common ground stories are so powerful. You tell the story, man, I can tell people what happened. My, I, can, I can tell them some stuff, man. I can tell my story. I can tell my story. And it's not just telling them the bad stuff that happened. The story was how God took me through every one of those things. And people look at me and say, listen, you went through all of those things and you, you're still excited about Jesus. Are you kidding me? He's the one that took me through every one of those valleys, man. I've got a story to tell. Now, please don't get stuck on the past, all right? Please, some of you will spend 
three quarters of an hour just telling how bad you were. Please don't spend too much time there. I beg you. Oh, I used to drink. I used to beat my wife up. Oh, my <laughs> gosh, I used to. I mean, my dad will tell you, tell you stories. A guy said, man, yeah, I killed a couple of, I killed this man. I'm not, seriously, please don't spend too much time on the past. <laughs> tell him about how God changed your life. How did you hear? What, what was your, man, what was the before and after? We all love before, Matt, come on now. Before, after. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, that's stupid, I know. It's really lame. I'll get Matt to put some decent stuff up on me. Before and after, that's your story. That's your story. That's your story. How many of you got a story? Let me see. How many of you got a story? Let me see your hands. You got a story. You know what's the hint? This is so many people's stories that their lives are such a mess right now. Listen to me. I've been in times when my life was a mess. That doesn't mean I don't have a story. You know, there's a place where people feel sorry for themselves and everyone feels sorry for them. But then there comes a place where you need to stop that thing and just grow out of that thing. All right? Just, come on, just move beyond your pettiness and your pitifulness and just, I, I don't mean to be harsh now. I'm not being, you understand, okay? All right, because some people want to tell, so, you, know, you know what I'm saying? And this, don't take, some of you, oh my gosh, oh, Peter's speaking to me right now. No, it's not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I, if it was, I, I, would, I would just tell Tom, it's you, it's not, but it's not. You tell them your story. The next one is you tell them the Jesus story. This is the Jesus story. And listen to me, this is where mom and dad can teach you. I, I'm telling you, they talk about the three circles. I, I, have, I have preached, I've, I've taught and at, the, at the park, and I did it at Unity Park, I did it at, Ch at Cheney. I just talk, about, the, talk about, about how the world is broken and how, every, I mean, I just go through the whole thing. And, and every time I've shared it, I've seen people respond to the good news of Jesus. Yeah. Every time. It's so simple. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to teach you that tonight. You're going to have to talk to Peter and John Vaughan Sr. for that. But I'm going to give you some examples, some examples of what the Jesus story is. And, and we, were, we were, a couple of weeks ago, we were, we had prayer, and, and uh, Gary and, and us guys here, and I shared this verse in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 16. My gosh, it was just so powerful. It was so powerful. Romans 5. Verse 16. Can I just read it quickly? You just, just bear with me. It says, For this free-flowing gift imparts to us so much more than what was given to us through the one who sinned. You know, as he's saying, listen, Adam really messed up, but something so much better came through Jesus. Now listen what he says. For because of Adam's transgression, we all face a guilty verdict of guilty. Is that true? Yes. We're all guilty. Right? He says, but this gracious gift leaves us free from our many failures and brings us into the perfect righteousness of God, and we are acquitted by the words, not guilty. Amen. Some people's idea of sharing the good news is to tell them how bad they are. <laughs> you are a sinner, you're going to hell. There's no good news in that. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Well, I preached the gospel. I told them how bad they were. Yes, I preached. <laughs> That's not good news. Come on, get real. Is that good news? The good news is not that all of us have sinned. The good news is that one man took the punishment for all of us and declared us not guilty. <laughs> Another one, Acts 10. He says, God has no favorites. Someone, someone says to me, he says, man, God, God, I don't know, God doesn't like me, man. He doesn't, he doesn't even answer my prayers. Listen to me. The nature of God, God says, he says, God has got no favorites, no favorites. So I can look at somebody and say, guess what? You, you're kind of a favorite one. He likes you. But I can say that to everybody else. God has got no favorites. Another good one is 2 Corinthians 5.19. It says these words, God holds nobody's sins against them. I've heard this so many times. People say, you can't believe what I've done. And I'm going to say to you something tonight here. I'm going to tell you something tonight. God doesn't hold your sins against you. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because he held your sins against Jesus. That's why. 
That's good news, man. That's good news. All right, so I'm, I'm just about done. So two days ago, I walked with my dad in the park, and, and I, I, I uh, oh, my gosh, I, I found something so utterly depressing. Really, seriously, you're not going to believe this. Are you ready? I'm being dead serious now. In fact, when I saw it on the ground, I walked past it for another 20, 30 yards, and I, I'm like, oh, no, I can't miss this one. So I walked back. Now, I'm pacing myself. I've got a three-mile circle. I'm working on a three-mile thing here. I'm like, okay. So I found this thing. Are you ready? Are you ready? I found this Powerball thing here with the words there, not a winner. <laughs> How depressing is that? How depressing is that? And I, as I walked and I thought, wait a minute, that's exactly what we need to hear with the gospel. Because people will live by this thing and they don't know that they're heirs of the Father. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. So everything is wrapped up. I missed the lottery. I'm not a winner. I'm a failure. Oh God, this thing proves that I'm a failure. And people miss. Part of the good news is to say to somebody, man, your life is not wrapped up in this thing. You are an heir. You're living as a, pop, as a poor person right now. You don't know. You, I've told so many people, you don't know how wealthy you are. You don't know how wealthy you are. You haven't discovered the pin number to your safe. You haven't used the key for your inheritance. That's, listen to me. Oh, you ready for another one? How many of you know what this is? Don't look at the continent. Look carefully. What is this? What is this? Do you know what it is? This is a mosaic. Isn't it beautiful? Given to me by a friend. And, and it's a mosaic of broken pieces. And I've actually used this in sharing the gospel. Is that takes, God takes the broken pieces of my life and he cements them with his love into something beautiful, a piece of art. I've just shared the good news right now. You see, some of you, you think you need a Bible degree and you need some certificate to say that I'm a disciple maker. No, you can, you can, you can share it. Oh, wait a minute, I've got some more. Oh, I've got some more. Um, oh, where do we go? Oh, yes, some Band-Aids. This is a good one. This is a good one. This is a good one. You, you can share the good news with absolutely anything around you. Band-Aids is a great one. I tell people, listen, man, you, you're trying to patch your life up with wounds that are so deep, you, can, you think band-aids are going to fix you up, man? Someone wants to go deeper than just your... You got it, right? Yeah, okay. You want another one? Oh, yeah, yeah. And people are walking around, and they wonder why they don't see God as being a good God. Why? Because people have told them all kinds of things that have colored the glasses. It's just stained the glasses. And listen to me. Oh, this, you would like more? Jesus, Jesus, just one of Jesus' ones. This is a good one. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to give you water that if you drink of this water, it's going to become a fountain. Think of that just for a minute. So if I drink from the water that Jesus gives, he said, that's the Holy Spirit, by the way. He says, if you drink of that water, that water, that drink, one drink, is going to transform into a fountain to provide drinks for everybody else. That, 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 that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Do you want one more? No, I've got, oh, how about this one? Keys, keys, keys are beautiful. Keys are beautiful. I said, someone, man, I've tried, I've tried everything. It didn't work. I said, listen, did you get the right key? How many of you know you've got to have the right key? So G Jesus said, listen, I'm the key. I'm the key to a good life. If you use me, if you use this key, it's going to work. How many keys are there in the world right now? All right. I, I, looked, for a, I looked for an acorn, and, and I, I'm sad to report that all the squirrels in Al Lopez had <laughs> totally desecrated the seeds. Totally gone. As I, I had all intentions to bring a beautiful, well-shaped acorn. I couldn't find one. 
the point is this. And I thought about it. How can I share the gospel? Well, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. You see, either the enemy is going to eat you up in that seed of who you are, or, 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 if you allow God to take you as a seed and plant you in him, you are going to produce so many more seeds than just this one. Listen, this is not complicated stuff. How many of you know you've got to use the right ingredients, the right proportion to get the right results? Let me tell you, there's nothing. You can take any, you can take, I, I challenge you, you can take absolutely everything and anything and be able to share the good news with that. That's what Jesus did. He said the sower goes to sow the seed. Jesus is talking about drinking water, for goodness sake. Amen? Go and get him. All right, let me close with one more. This one's precious. One of my favorite ways to share, and I'm going to give to Guy in a moment, one of the favorite ways to share the good news is this table. I've done it so many times at Unity Park and Cheney Park whenever I break communion. <clears throat> we take the place, we break the bread. And I tell people this is what my life looked like. Broken. Everybody understands broken, friends. Everybody understands that. Everybody understands it. They get it. Oh, man, grape juice is because of broken, crushed, crushed there. Somehow God figured out a way to take a brokenness and broken pieces and bring healing. Lord, seal this word in our hearts in Jesus' name.